Ulysses by James Joyce, section 10b. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The lackey by the door of Dylan's auction rooms shook his handbell twice and viewed himself in the chalked mirror of the cabinet. Dilly Dedalus, listening in the curbstone, heard the beats of the bell and the cries of the auctioneer within, four and nine, those lovely curtains, five shillings, cosy curtains, selling new at two guineas, any advance on five shillings, going for five shillings. The lackey lifted his handbell and shook it. Barang! Bang of the last lap bell spurred the half-time wheelmen to their spirit. J. A. Jackson, W. E. Wiley, A. Monroe, H. T. Gayen. Their stretched necks wagging negotiated the curve by the college library. Mr. Dedalus, trudging a long mustache, came round from William's row. He halted near his daughter. It's time for you, she said. Stand up straight for the love of Lord Jesus, Mr. Dedalus said. Are you trying to imitate your Uncle John, the coronet player, head upon shoulders? Melancholy God! Dilly shrugged her shoulders. Mr. Dedalus placed his hands on them and held them back. Stand up straight, girl, he said. You'll get curvature of the spine. Do you know what you look like? He let his head sink suddenly down and forward, hunching his shoulders and drooping his under jaw. Give it up, father, Dilly said. All the people are looking at you. Mr. Dedalus drew himself upright and tugged again at his mustache. Did you get any money? Dilly asked. Where would I get money? Mr. Dedalus said. There is no one in Dublin would lend me fourpence. You got some, Dilly said, looking in his eyes. How do you know that? Mr. Dedalus asked, his tongue in his cheek. Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked, walked boldly along James Street. I know you did, Dilly answered. Were you in the Scotch house now? I was not then, Mr. Dedalus said, smiling. Was it the little nuns taught you to be so saucy? Here. He handed her a shilling. See if you can do anything with that, he said. I suppose you got five, Dilly said. Give me more of that. Wait a while, Mr. Dedalus said threateningly. You're like the rest of them, aren't you? An insolent pack of little bitches since your poor mother died. But wait a while. You'll get a short shrift and a long day for me, low blackguardism. I'm going to get rid of you. Wouldn't care if I was stretched out stiff. He's dead. The man upstairs is dead. He left her and walked on. Dilly followed quickly and pulled his coat. Well, what is it? he said, stopping. The racky, lackey rang his bell behind their backs. Barang! Curse your bloody blatant soul! Mr. Dedalus cried, turning on him. The lackey, aware of comment, shook the lolling clapper of his bell, but feebly. Bang! Mr. Dedalus stared at him. Watch him, he said. It's instructive. I wonder will he allow us to talk? You got more than that, father, Dilly said. I'm going to show you a little trick, Mr. Dedalus said. I'll leave you all where Jesus left the Jews. Look, that's all I have. I got two shillings from Jack Power and I spent twopence for a shave for the funeral. He drew forth a handful of copper coins nervously. Can't you look for some money somewhere, Dilly said. Mr. Dedalus thought and nodded. I will, he said gravely. I looked all along the gutter in O'Connell Street. I'll try this one now. You're very funny, Dilly said, grinning. Here, Mr. Dedalus said, handing her two pennies, get a glass of milk for yourself and a bun or something. I'll be home shortly. He put the other coins in his pocket and started to walk on. The vice-regal cavalcade passed, greeted by obsequious policemen out of Parkgate. I'm sure you have another shilling, Dilly said. The lackey banged loudly. Mr. Dedalus, amid the din, walked off, murmuring to himself with a pursing, mincing mouth. The little nuns, nice little things, oh, sure, they wouldn't do anything, oh, sure, they wouldn't really. Is it little sister Monica? From the sundial towards James's gate walked Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked for Pulbrook Robertson, boldly along James's street, past Shackleton's offices. Got round him all right. How do you do, Mr. Crimmins? First rate, sir. I was afraid you might be up in your other establishment in Pimlico. How are things going? Just keeping alive. Lovely weather we are having. Yes, indeed. Good for the country. Those farmers are always grumbling. I'll take a thimbleful of your best gym, Mr. Crimmins. 
Small gin, sir. Yes, sir. Terrible affair. That General Sulcum explosion. Terrible. Terrible. A thousand casualties. And heart-rending scenes. Men trampling down women and children. Most brutal thing. What do they say was the cause? Spontaneous combustion. Most scandalous revelation. Not a single lifeboat would float, and the fire hose all burst. What I can't understand is how the inspectors ever allowed a boat like that. Now you are talking straight, Mr. Crimmins. You know why? Palm oil. Is that a fact? Without a doubt. Well, now, look at that. And America, they say, is the land of the free. I thought we were bad here. I smiled at him. America, I said quietly, just like that. What is it? The sweepings of every country, including our own. Isn't that true? That's a fact. Graft, my dear sir. Well, of course, there's plenty of money going. There's always someone to pick it up. Saw him looking at my frock coat dress, does it? Nothing like a dressy appearance. Bowls them over. Hello, Simon, Father Crawley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. Mr. Kernan halted and preened himself before the sloping mirror of Peter Kennedy, hairdresser. Stylish coat, beyond a doubt. Scott of Dawson Street. Well worth the half-sovereign I gave Neary for it. Never built under three guineas. Fits me down to the ground. Some Kildare Street Club toff had it, probably. John Mulligan, the manager of Hibernian Bank, gave me a very sharp eye yesterday on Carlisle Bridge, as if he remembered me. Ahem, must dress the character of those fellows, knight of the road, gentlemen. And now, Mr. Crimmins... May we have the honour of your custom again, sir, the cup that cheers but not inebriates, as the old saying has it. North Wall and Sir John Rogerson's K, with hulls and anchor chains, sailing westward, sailed by a skiff, a crumpled throwaway, rocked on the ferry wash, Elijah is coming. Mr. Kernan glanced in farewell at his image, high colour, of course grizzled moustache. Returned Indian officer, bravely he bore his stumpy body forward on spatted feet, squaring his shoulders. Is that Lambert's brother over the way, Sam? What? Yes. He's like it as damn it. No, the windscreen of the motor car in the sun there. Just a flash like that. Damn like him. Ahem. Hot spirit of jun juniper juice warmed his vitals in his breath good drop of gin that was his frock tails winked in bright sunshine to his fat strut down there emmet was hanged drawn and quartered greasy black rope dogs licked the blood off the street when the lord lieutenant's wife drove by in her naughty let me see is he buried in st Mich mickens oh no there was a midnight burial in glasnevin corpse brought in through a secret door in the wall dignam is there now went out in a puff well well better turn down here make a detour mr kernan turned and walked down the slope of watling street by the corner of guinness's visitors waiting room outside the dublin distilleries company stores an outside ear without fare or jarvey stood the reins knotted to the wheel damn dangerous thing some tipperary bosthoon endangering the lives of the citizens runaway horse dennis breen with his tomes weary of having waited an hour in john henry menton's office led his wife over a connell bridge bound for the office of messrs collis and ward mr kernan approached island street times of the troubles must ask ned lambert to lend me those reminiscences of john uh, jonah barrington when you look back on it all now, a kind of retrospective arrangement. Gaming at dailies, no card sharping then. One of these fellows got his hand nailed to the table by a dagger. Somewhere here, Lord Edward Fitzgerald escaped from Major Sir. Stables behind Moira House. Damn good gin that was. Fine, dashing young nobleman, good stock, of course. That ruffian, that sham squire with his violet gloves, gave him away. Of course they were on the wrong side. They rose in dark and evil days, fine poem that is, Ingram. They were gentlemen. Ben Dollard does sing that ballad touchingly, masterly rendition. At the siege of Ross did my father fall. 
A cavalcade, an easy trot along Pembroke Cay, past outriders leaping, leaping in their, in their saddles, frock coats, cream sunshades. Mr. Kernan hurried forward, blowing pursily, his excellently too bad. Just missed that by a hair. Damn it, what a pity. Stephen Dedalus watched through the webbed window. The lapidary's fingers prove a time-dulled chain. Dust webbed the window and the show trays. Dust darkened the toiling fingers with their vulture nails. Dust slept on dull coils, bronze and silver, lozenges of cinnabar, on rubies, leprous and wine-dark stones. Born all in dark, wormy earth, cold specks of fire, evil lights shining in the darkness, where fallen archangels flung the stars of their brows, muddy swine snouts hands root and root gripe and rest them she dances in a foul gloom where gum burns with garlic a sailor man rust bearded sips from a beaker rum and eyes her a long sea-fed silent rut she dances capers wagging her sowish haunches and her hips on her gross belly flapping a ruby egg old russell with a smeared chamois rag burnished his again his gem turned it and held it at the point of his Moses's beard, grandfather ape gloating on a stolen hoard, and you who wrest old images from the burial earth, the brain-sick words of sophist, antithesines, a lore of drugs, orient and immortal wheat standing from everlasting to everlasting. Two old women, fresh from their whiff, of the briny trudge through Irish town along London Bridge Road, one with sanded umbrella, one with a midwife's bag in which eleven cockles rolled, the whir of flapping leather bands and hum of dynamos from the powerhouse urged Stephen to be on. Beingless being, stop, throb always without you and throb always within. Your heart you sing of, I between them, where? Between two roaring worlds where they swirl, I shatter them one and both but stun myself too in the blow shatter me you who can bod and butcher were the words i say not yet a while look around yes quite true very large and wonderful and keeps famous time you say right sir a monday morning twas so indeed stephen went down bedford row the handle of the ash clacking against his shoulder blade in Clohissy's window, a faded eighteen sixty print of Heenan boxing sayers held his eye. Staring backers with square hats stood round the rope prize ring. The heavyweights in light loincloths proposed gently to each other his bulbous fist. And there throbbing heroes' hearts. He turned and halted by the slanted book cart. Two pence each, the huckster said, four for six pence tattered pages of the irish beekeeper life and miracles of the cure of arts pocket guide to killarney i might find here one of my pawn school prizes stefano didolo alumno optimo palman ferenti father conmi having read his little hours walked through the hamlet of don carney murmuring vespers Binding too good, probably. What is this? Eighth and ninth book of Mo Moses, secret of all secrets, seal of King David, thumbled pages, rid and read. Who has passed before me? How to soften chapped hands, recipe for white wine vinegar, how to win a woman's love. For me, this. Say the following talisman three times with hand folded. Say el yilo. Nebracar feminum amor me solo, sanctus amen. Who wrote this? Charms and invocations of the most blessed abbot Peter Salanca. To all true believers divulge, as good as any other abbot's charms, as mumbling Joachim's, down bally noddle, or we'll wool your wool. What are you doing here, Stephen? Dilly's high shoulders and shabby dress. Shut the book quick. Don't let's see. What are you doing? Stephen said. A Stuart face of none such Charles, lank locks falling at its sides. 
It glowed as she crouched, feeding the fire with broken boots. I told her of Paris, late lie abed under a quilt of overcoats, fingering a pinchbeck bracelet, Dan Kelly's token. Nebracadaba feminum. What have you there? Stephen asked. I bought it from the other cart for a penny, Dilly said, laughing nervously. Is it any good? My eyes say she has. Do others see me so? Quick, far, and daring, shadow of my mind. He took the coverless book from her hand. Chardinal's French primer. What did you buy that for, he said, to learn French? She nodded, reddening, and closed tight her lips. Show no surprise, quite natural. Here, Stephen said, it's all right. Mind Maggie doesn't pawn it on you. I suppose all my books are gone. Some, Dilly said, we had to. She is drowning. Agenbite, save her. Agenbite, all against us. She will drown me with her eyes and hair, lank coils of seaweed hair round me, my heart, my soul. Salt, green, death, we. Agenbite of Inwit. Inwit's Agenbite, misery. Misery. Hello, Simon, Father Crowley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. They clasped hands loudly outside Reddy and daughters. Father Cowley brushed his mustache off and downward with a scooping hand. What's the best news? Mr. Dedalus said. Why, not much, Father Cowley said. I'm barricaded up, Simon, with two men prowling around the house trying to effect an entrance. Jolly, Mr. Dedalus said. Who is it? Oh, Father Cowley said, a certain gombean man of our acquaintance. With a broken back, is it? Mr. Dedalus asked. The same, Simon. Father Crowley answered. Reuben of that ilk, I'm just waiting for Ben Dollard. He's going to say a word to Long John to get him to take those two men off. All I want is a little time. He looked with vague hope up and down the quay, a big apple bulging in his neck. I know, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding. Poor old Bodocky Ben. He's always go doing a good turn for someone. Hold hard. He put on his glasses and gazed towards the metal bridge an instant. There he is, by God, he said, arse and pockets, Ben Dollard's loose blue cutaway and square hat above large slops, crossed the quay in full gait from the metal bridge. He came towards them at an amble, scratchingly act scratching actively behind his coat tails. As he came near, metal Mr. Dedalus greeted. Hold that fellow with the bowed, bad trousers. Hold him now, Ben Dollard said. Mr. Dellis eyed with cold, wandering scorn various points of Ben Dollard's figure. Then, turning to Father Cowley with a nod, he muttered sneeringly, That's a petty garment, isn't it, for a summer's day? Why, God eternally curse your soul, Ben Dow Dollard growled furiously. I threw out more clothes in my time than you ever saw. He stood beside them, beaming on them first on his roomy clothes, from points of which Mr. Dedalus flicked fluff, saying, They were made for a man of his health. Ben, anyhow. Bad luck to the Jew man that made them, Ben Dollard said. Thanks be to God, he's not paid yet. And how is that basso profundo, Benjamin? Father Cowley asked. Cashel, Boyle, O'Connor, Fitmaurice, Tisdall, Farrell, murmuring, glassy-eyed, strode past the Kildare Street Club. Ben Dollard frowned and, making suddenly a chanter's mouth, gave forth a deep, deep note. Ah, he said. That's the style, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding to its drone. What about that, Ben Dollard said, not too dusty, what? He turned to both. That'll do, Father Cowley said, nodding also. The Reverend Hugh C. Love walked from old chapter house of St. Mary's, Abbey Past Jane, and Charles Kennedy's rectifiers, attended by Geraldine's tall and personable, towards Falsell beyond the ford of hurdles. Ben Dollard, with, heavy, with a heavy list towards the shop fronts, led him forward, his joyful fingers in the air. Come along with me to sub-sheriff's office, he said. I want to show you the new beauty Rock has for bailiff. He's a cross between Lobangula and Lynchehan. He's well worth seeing, mind you. Come along. 
I saw John Henry Menton casually in the bodega just now, and it will cost me a fall if I don't wait a while. We're on the right lay, Bob, believe you me. For a few days, tell him, Father Cowley said anxiously. Ben Dollard halted and stared, his loud orifice open, a dangling button off his coat wagging bright back from its thread as he wiped away the heavy shrums that clogged his eyes to hear aright. What few days, he boomed. Hasn't your landlord distrained for rent? He has, Father Cowley said. Then her friend's writ is not worth the paper it's printed on, Ben Dollard said. The landlord has the prior claim. I gave him all the particulars, 29 Windsor Avenue. Love, the, love is the name? That's right, Father Cowley said, the Reverend Mr. Love. He's a minister in the country somewhere, but are you sure of that? You can tell Barbarus from me, Ben Dollard said, that he can put that writ where Jacko put the nuts. He let Father Cowley boldly forward, linked to his bulk. Filberts, I believe they were, Mr. Dedalus said, as he dropped his glasses on his coat front, following them. The youngster will be all right, Martin Cunningham said, as they passed out of the castle yard gate. The policeman touched his forehead. God bless you, Martin Cunningham said cheerfully. He signed to the waiting Jarvie, who chucked at the reins and set on towards Lord Edward Street. Bronze by gold, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head, appeared above the cross-blind of the Ormond Hotel. Yes, Martin Cunningham said, fingering his beard. I wrote to Father Conmee and laid the whole case before him. You could try our friend, Mr. Power suggested backward. Boyd, Martin Cunningham said shortly, touch me not. John Wise Nolan, lagging behind, reading the list, came after them quickly down Cork Hill. On the steps of the City Hall, Councillor Nanetti, descending, hailed Alderman Cowley and Councillor Abraham Lyon, ascending. The castle car wheeled empty into Upper Exchange Street. "'Look here, Martin,' John Wise Nolan said, overtaking them at the mail office. "'I see Bloom put his name down for five shillings.' "'Quite right.' "'Martin Cunningham said, taking the list, "'and put down the five shillings, too. "'Without a second word, either,' Mr. Power said. "'Strange but true,' Martin Cunningham added. "'John Wise Nolan opened wide eyes. "'I'll say there is much kindness in the Jew,' he quoted elegantly. "'They went down Parliament Street. "'There's Jimmy Henry,' Mr. Power said, "'just heading for Kavanaugh's. Right o, Martin Cunningham said. Here goes. Outside La Maison Claire, Blazes Boylan waylaid Jack Mooney's brother in law, humpy, tight, making for the liberties. John Wise Nolan fell back with Mr. Power, while Martin Cunningham took the elbow of the dapper little man in a shower of hail suit, who walked uncertainly with hasty steps past Mickey Anderson's watches. The assistant town clerk's corns are giving him some trouble. John Wise Nolan told Mr. Power. They followed round the corner towards James Cavanaugh's wine-rooms. The empty castle car fronted them at rest in Essex Gate. Martin Cunningham, speaking always, showed often the list at which Jimmy Henry did not glance. "'And long John Fanning is here, too,' John Wise Nolan said, "'as large as life.' The tall form of long John Fanning filled the doorway where he stood, "'Good day, Mr. Subsheriff,' Martin Cunningham said, as all halted and greeted. Long John Fanning made no way for them. He removed his large Henry Clay decisively, and his large fierce eyes scowled intelligently over all their faces. "'Are the conscript fathers pursuing their peaceful deliberations?' he said, with rich, acrid utterance to the assistant town clerk. "'Hell open to Christians they were having,' Jimmy Henry said pettishly, "'about their damned Irish language. "'Where was the marshal, he wanted to know, "'to keep order in the council chamber? "'An old Barlow, the mace-bearer, laid up with asthma, "'no mace on the table, nothing in order, "'no quorum even, and Hutchinson, the Lord Mayor, "'in Londono, and little Lorcan Sherlock "'doing locum tenens for him. "'Damned Irish language, language of our forefathers.' Long John Fanning blew a plume of smoke from his lips. 
Martin Cunningham spoke by turns, twirling the peak of his beard to the assistant town clerk and the sub-sheriff, while John Wise Nolan held his peace. "'What dignum was that?' Long John Fanning asked. Jimmy Henry made a grimace and lifted his left foot. "'Oh, my corns!' he said plaintively. "'Come upstairs, for goodness' sake, till I sit down somewhere. Oof! Ooh! Mind!' Testily he made room for himself beside Long John Fanning's flank, and passed in and up the stairs. "'Come on up,' Martin Cunningham said to the sub-sheriff. "'I don't think you knew him, or perhaps you did, though.' With John Wise Nolan, Mr. Power followed them in. "'Decent little soul he was,' Mr. Power said to the stalwart back of Long John Fanning, ascending towards Long John Fanning in the mirror. "'Rather low-sized, dignum of Menton's office that was,' Martin Cunningham said. Long John Fanning could not remember him. "'Clatter of horse-hoofs sounded from the air. "'What's that?' Martin Cunningham said. All turned where they stood. John Wise Nolan came down again. From the cool shadows of the doorway he saw the horses pass Parliament Street, harness and glossy pasterns in sunlight shimmering. Gaily they went past before his cool, unfriendly eyes, not quickly. In saddles of the leaders, leaping leaders, rode outriders. "'What was it?' Martin Cunningham asked, as they went on up the staircase." "'The Lord Lieutenant-General and General Governor of Ireland,' John Wise Nolan answered from the stair-foot. As they trod across the thick carpet, Buck Mulligan whispered behind his Panama to Haynes, "'Parnell's brother, there in the corner.' They chose a small table near the window opposite a long-faced man whose beard and gaze hung intently down on a chessboard. "'Is that he?' Haynes asked, twisting round in his seat. Yes, Mulligan said, that's John Howard, his brother, our city marshal. John Howard Parnell translated a white bishop quietly, and his grey claw went up again to his forehead, whereat it rested. An instant after, under its screen, his eyes looked quickly, ghost-bright, at his foe, and fell once more upon a working corner. I'll take a melange. Haynes said to the waitress. Two melanges, Buck Mulligan said, and bring us some scones and butter and some cakes as well. When she had gone, he said, laughing, We call it DBC, because they have damn bad cakes. Oh, but you missed Daedalus on Hamlet. Haynes opened his new-bought book. I'm sorry, he said. Shakespeare is the happy hunting ground of all minds that have lost their balance. The one-legged sailor growled at the area of 14 Nelson Street. "'England expects!' Buck Mulligan's primrose waistcoat shook gaily to his laughter. "'You should see him,' he said, "'when his body loses its balance. "'Wandering Angus, I call him.' "'I am sure he has an idée fixe,' Haynes said, "'pinching his chin thoughtfully with thumb and forefinger. "'How I am speculating what it would be likely to be,' Such persons always have. Buck Mulligan bent across the table gravely. They drove his wits astray, he said, by visions of hell. He will never capture the attic note, the note of Swinburne, of all poets, the white death and the ruddy birth. That is his tragedy. He can never be a poet, the joy of creation. Eternal punishment, Haynes said, nodding curtly. I see. I tackled him this morning on belief. There was something on his mind, I saw. It's rather interesting, because Professor Pokorny of Vienna makes an interesting point out of that. Buck Mulligan's watchful eyes saw the waitress come. He helped her to unload her tray. "'He can find no trace of hell in ancient Irish myth,' Haynes said, amid the cheerful cups. "'The moral idea seems lacking, the sense of destiny, of retribution.' Rather strange he should have just that fixed idea. Does he write anything for your movement? He sank two lumps of sugar deftly longwise through the whipped cream. Buck Mulligan slit a steaming scone in two and plastered butter over its smoking pith. He bit off a soft piece hungrily. Ten years, he said, chewing and laughing. He is going to write something in ten years. 
seems a long way off, Haynes said, thoughtfully lifting his spoon. Still, I shouldn't wonder if he did after all. He tasted a spoonful from the creamy cone of his cup. This is real Irish cream, I take it, he said with forbearance. I don't want to be imposed on. Elijah, skiff, light, crumpled throwaway, sailed eastward by flanks of ships and trawlers, amid an archipelago of corks, beyond New Wapping Street, past Benson's Ferry, and by the three-masted schooner Rosevian from Bridgewater with the bricks. Almidano Artifoni walked past Hollis Street, past Sewell's Yard. Behind him Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, with stick-umbrella a just coat dangling, shunned the lamp before Mr. Law Smith's house and, crossing, walked along Marion Square. Distantly behind him a blind stripling tapped his way by the wall of College Park. Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell walked as far as Mr. Lewis Werner's cheerful windows, then turned and strode back along Marion Square, his stick-umbrella adjust coat dangling. At the corner of Wilde's he halted, frowned at Elijah's name announced on the Metropolitan Hall, frowned at the distant pleasance of Duke's lawn. His eyeglasses flashed frowning in the sun. With rat's teeth bared he muttered, Coactus volui. He strode on for Clare Street, grinding his fierce word. As he strode past Mr. Bloom's dental windows, the sway of his dust-coat brushed rudely from its angle a slender tapping cane, and swept onwards, having buffeted a thewless body. The blind stripling turned his sickly face after the striding form. "'God's curse on you,' he said sourly. "'Whoever you are, you're blinder nor I am, you bitch's bastard!' Opposite Ruggie O'Donohue's Master Patrick Aloysius Dignum, pawing, uh, pawing the pound and a half of Mangan's, late Fahrenbach's pork steaks he had been sent for, went along warm Wicklow Street, dawdling. It was too blooming dull sitting in the parlour with Mrs. Stower and Mrs. Quigley and Mrs. MacDowell and the blind down, and they all at their sniffles and sipping sups of the superior tawny sherry Uncle Barney brought from Tunney's and they eating crumbs of the cottage fruit-cake, jawing the whole blooming time, and sighing. After Wicklow Lane, the window of Madame Doyle, court-dress milliner, stopped him. He stood looking in at the two puckers, stripped to their pelts and putting up their props. From the side-mirrors, two mourning masters, Dignum gaped silently. Myler Keogh, Dublin's pet lamb, will meet Sergeant Major Bennett, the Portobello Bruiser, for a purse of fifty sovereigns. Gob, that'd be a good pucking match to see. Myler Keogh, that's the chap sparring out to him with the green sash. Two-bar entrance, soldiers half price. I could easy do a bunk on Ma. Master Dignam on his left turned as he turned. That's me in mourning. When is it? May the twenty-second. Sure, the blooming thing is all over. He turned to the right, and on his right Master Dignam turned, his cap awry, his collar sticking up. Buttoning it down, his chin lifted, he saw the image of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, beside the two puckers. One of them mots that do be in the packets of fag stores smokes, that his old fellow welted hell out of him for one time he found out. Master Dignam got his collar down and dawdled on. The best pucker going for strength was Fitzsimmons. One puck in the wind from that fellow would knock you into the middle of next week, man. But the best pucker for science was Jem Corbett before Fitzsimmons knocked the stuffings out of him, dodging and all. In Grafton Street, Master Dignam saw a red flower in a toff's mouth, and a swell pair of kicks on him, and he listening to what the drunk was telling him and grinning all the time. No Sandy Mount tram. Master Dignam walked along Nassau Street, shifted the pork stakes to his other hand. His collar sprang up again, and he tugged it down. The blooming stud was too small for the buttonhole of the shirt, blooming end to it. He met schoolboys with satchels. I'm not going tomorrow either. Stay away till Monday. He met other schoolboys. 
Do they notice I'm in mourning? Uncle Barney said he'd get it into the paper tonight. Then they'll all see it in the paper and read my name printed and Pa's name. His face got all grey instead of being red like it was, and there was a fly walking over it up to his eye. The scrunch that was when they were screwing the screws into the coffin, and the bumps when they were bringing it downstairs. Pa was inside it, and Ma crying in the parlor, and Uncle Barney telling the men how to get it round the bend. A big coffin it was, and high and heavy-looking. How was that? The last night Pa was boozed, he was standing on the landing there, bawling out for his boots to go out to Tunney's for to booze more, and he looked buddy and short in his shirt. Never see him again. Death, that is. Pa is dead. My father is dead. He told me to be a good son to Ma. I couldn't hear the other things he said, but I saw his tongue and his teeth trying to say it better. Poor Pa! That was Mr. Dignam, my father. I hope he is in purgatory now, because he went to confession to Father Conroy on Saturday night. William Humble, Earl of Dudley, and Lady Dudley, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Heseltine, drove out after luncheon from the Viceregal Lodge. In the following carriage were the Honourable Mrs. Paget, Miss de Courcy, and the Honourable Gerald Ward A.D.C. in attendance. The cavalcade passed out by the lower gate of Phoenix Park, saluted by obsequious policemen, and proceeded past Kingsbridge along the northern quays. The Viceroy was most cordially greeted on his way through the metropolis. At Bloody Bridge Mr. Thomas Kernan, beyond the river, greeted him vainly from afar. Between Queen's and Whitworth Bridges, Lord Dudley's viceregal carriages passed, and were unsaluted by Mr. Dudley White, B.L., M.A., who stood on Aaron K. outside Mrs. M.E. White's, the pawnbroker's, at the corner of Aaron Street West, stroking his nose with his forefinger, undecided whether he should arrive at Fibsboro more quickly by a triple change of tram, or by hailing a car, or on foot through Smithfield, Constitution Hill, and Broadstone Terminus. In the porch of four courts, with Richie Goulding, with the coats bag of Goulding, Collis, and Ward, saw him with surprise. Past Richmond Bridge, at the doorstep of the office, of Reuben J. Dodd, solicitor, agent for the Patriotic Insurance Company, an elderly female about to enter changed her plan, and, retracing her steps by King's windows, smiled credulously, credulously, on the representative of His Majesty. From its sluice in Wood K. Wall, under Tom Devon's office, Poddle River hung out in fealty a tongue of liquid sewage. Above the cross-blind of the Ormond Hotel, gold by bronze, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head watched and admired. On Ormond K. Mr. Simon Dedalus, steering his way from the greenhouse for the sub-sheriff's office, stood still in mid-street, and brought his hat low. His Excellency, grac his Excellency graciously returned Mr. Dedalus's greeting. From Cahill's corner the Reverend Hugh C. Love, M.A., made obeisance unperceived, mindful of Lord's deputies whose hands, benignant, had held of your rich advowsons. On Grattan Bridge Lenehan and McCoy, taking leave of each other, watched the carriages go by. Passing by Roger Green's office and Dollard's big red printing house, Gertie McDowell, carrying the Catesby Cork lino letters for her father, who was laid up, knew by the style it was the Lord and Lady Lieutenant, but she couldn't see what Her Excellency had on, because the tram and Spring's big yellow furniture van had to stop in front of her on account of its being the Lord Lieutenant. Beyond Lundy's Beyond Lundy Foots, from the shaded door of Kavanaugh's wine-rooms, John Wise Nolan smiled with unseen coldness towards the Lord Lieutenant-General and General Governor of Ireland. The Right Honourable William Humble, Earl of Dudley, G.C.V.O., passed Mickey Anderson's all-times ticking watches, and Henry and James's wax smart-suited fresh-cheeked models, the gentleman Henry, Dernier Cree James. Over against Dame Gate, Tom Roachford <clears throat> and Nosy Flynn watched the approach of the cavalcade. Tom Roachford, seeing the eyes of Lady Dudley fixed on him, 
took his thumbs quickly out of the pockets of his claret waistcoat, and doffed his cap to her. A charming soubrette, great Marie Kendall, with dauby cheeks and lifted skirt, smiled daubily from her poster upon William Humble, Earl of Dudley, and upon Lieutenant Colonel H. G. Hesseltine, and also upon the Honourable Gerald Ward, A.D.C. From the window of the D.B.C., Buck Mulligan gaily and Haynes gravely, gazed down on the viceregal equipage over the shoulders of eager guests, whose mass of forms darkened the chessboard whereon John Howard Parnell looked intently. In Fauna Street, Dilly Dedalus, straining her sight upward from Chardinal, Chardinal's first French primer, primer, saw sunshades spanned and wheel-spokes spinning in the glare. John Henry Menton, filling the doorway of commercial buildings, stared from wine-big oyster eyes, holding a fat gold hunter watch not looked at in his fat left hand not feeling it. Where the foreleg of King Billy's horse pawed the air, Mrs. Breen plucked her hastening husband back from under the hoofs of the outriders. She shouted in his ear the tidings. Understanding, he shifted his tomes to his left breast and saluted the second carriage. The Honourable Gerald Ward, A.D.C., agreeably surprised, made haste to reply. At Ponsonby's corner a jaded white flagon, H., halted, and four tall-hatted white flagons halted behind him, E-L-Y-S, while outriders pranced past and carriages. Opposite Piggott's music ware-rooms, Mr. Gen Dennis J. Magini, professor of dancing, etc., gaily apparelled, gravely walked, out passed by a viceroy, and unobserved. By the provost's wall came jauntily Blazes Boylan, stepping in tanned shoes and socks with sky-blue clocks, to the refrain of, My girl's a Yorkshire girl. Blazes Boylan presented to the leaders sky-blue frontlets and high action a sky-blue tie, a wide-brimmed straw hat at a rakish angle, and a suit of indigo serge. His hands in his jacket pockets forgot to salute, but he offered to the three ladies the bold admiration of his eyes, and the red flower between his lips. As they drove along Nassau Street, His Excellency drew the attention of his bowling consort to the programme of music which was being discoursed in College Park. Unseen brazen highland laddies blared and drum-thumped after the cortege. But though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes, barabum, yet I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire rose. Barabum. Thither of the wall, the quarter-mile flat handicappers, M. C. Green, H. Thrift, T. M. Patty, C. Scaife, J. B. Jeffs, G. N. Morphy, F. Stevenson, C. Adderley, and W. C. Huggard started in pursuit. Striding past Finn's Hotel, Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, stared through a fierce eyeglass across the carriages at the head of Mr. M. E. Solomons in the window of the Austro-Hungarian vice-consulate. Deep in Leinster Street, by Trinity's postern, a loyal kingsman, hornblower, touched his tally-ho cap. As the glossy horses pranced by Marion Square, Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, waiting, saw salutes being given to the gent with the topper, and raised also his new black cap, with fingers greased by pork-steak paper. His collar, too, sprang up. The viceroy, on his way to inaugurate the Myris Bazaar in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital, drove with his following towards Lower Mount Street. He passed a blind stripling opposite Broadbent's. In Lower Mount Street a pedestrian, in a brown mackintosh, eating dry bread, passed swiftly and unscathed across the Viceroy's path. At the Royal Canal Bridge, from his hoarding, Mr. Eugene Stratton, his blub-lips a-grin, bade all comers welcome to Pembroke Township. At Haddington Road Corner two sanded women halted themselves, an umbrella and a bag in which eleven cockles rolled to view with wonder the Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress without his golden chain. 
On Northumberland and Lansdowne roads his excellency acknowledged punctually salutes from rare male walkers, the salute of two small schoolboys at the garden gate of the house said to have been admired by the late queen when visiting the Irish capital with her husband, the prince consort, in 1849, and the salute of Almidano Artifoni's sturdy trousers, swallowed by a closing door. End of chapter 10 Read by Hugh and Kara and Mike on August 21st, 2006 and 22nd, 2006.